Welcome to a special segment of the Art Settlers of New York, showcasing Adelita Medina's first exhibition in New York City at the Luisa Capetillo Gallery, located at the MNN El Barrio Firehouse Community Media Center. This exhibition is held from March 16th to June 17th, so you have enough time to come and visit. Adelita Medina is an anti-war peace activist, a journalist, a writer, and a visual artist whose life-transforming artworks convey personal points of view to raise social awareness. Her paintings are mesmerizing, mixed-media artworks that are rhythmical and expressive. She works with acrylics and paper collage to layer her canvases and often incorporates <coughs> other elements into her artwork. An essential feature in her paintings is the use of words that she uses to express her views about human rights, the degradation of our planet, and social issues that cripple our society. She <coughs> builds each piece by weaving together all these elements in layers, fragmenting and interchanging them so that they inform each other. Although they are full of creativity, each artwork presents one clear idea at a time. Adelita, welcome. It is such an honor to interview you. Thank you, thank you. This is an um, incredible exhibition by looking at all the artworks. What I can see is your journey. So I want to start with your journey because you started, you have such a long <laughs> career <laughs> and a long journey as a, as a social activist, uh, social movement of, the, of human rights. So what was, first of all, tell us what was the first, the turning point in your life that brought you from, from being a journalist, a writer, an activist, to discovering art, because I know you studied art, mm -hmm. but you didn't necessarily dedicate your life mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I was a student in college at New Mexico Highlands University, which is a small college in northern New Mexico, where I grew up. And so uh, I did, I studied uh, art and English and I wanted to be a teacher so I studied secondary education. And uh, then uh, along came the Chicano movement in the 1970s. So uh, I was kind of challenged to become politically aware, which at that time I was just a regular student doing what other regular students did and just studying and partying and doing all kinds of other things. And then the Chicano movement hit Las Vegas, New Mexico New Mexico Highlands University and I started to become politicized, become aware of what was going on at the university because mm. the university had some very uh, anti-Chicano and anti-Indian anti policies and history and so the students decided in the 1970s at the college like they're doing now at the high schools to rebel and say enough is enough and we want uh, education that's relevant to our history and our people and so I was one of those outspoken people and I actually became the editor of the school paper and then uh, uh, so that's what really uh, opened up my mind and so art kind of took a back seat <laughs> to now my, my Chicanismo and my activism and and then after I left the university, I went to work in the community, again, organizing students. We had the students in the middle schools walk out, students in the high schools walk out. And then we started uh, our own school, an alternative school, uh, named after a priest in New Mexico that uh, educated Indians and girls back in the 1800s. So that's how my political career and life began. And, and then you were uh, what, 19? I was uh, yeah, I was 20 actually 20, when I became okay. politicized. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so so that's how I started doing that. And then I wrote for a, a, a community newspaper called El Grito del Norte about people's struggles in uh, northern New Mexico in the reservations in uh, Latin America and so I became like a little more politicized about what was going on in Latin America as well, you know. And I didn't learn that in the in the in the college. Uh, we learned that by reading books and reading newspapers and reading articles. So that so I became, as you could say, politicized. No, right. And you're reflecting that in your works. Yes. So the title of this exhibition, "We the People." Yes. And that's pretty much uh, the first artwork I would love to explore with you. Okay. Well, um, the that uh, title comes about because during the debates between Hillary Clinton and and Donald Trump, they kept talking about 
uh, the people want this and the people want that and everything about the people, the people, the people. And then I was thinking the messages that they were, they weren't really addressing the people that I grew up with, the people that I work with, the, you know, my ancestors or my descendants or whatever. So I said to myself, well, uh, you know, what people are they talking about? Mm. So I decided to, uh, uh, s that, I, that I needed to start writing about uh, what was going on, the, the fears that I had that the new administration was going to usher in, turning the clock back on all the work that we had done in the decades before. And so uh, I said, let me write. And so I sat at my computer and I, and I tried to write articles that I thought maybe I could you know, share around the country and stuff like that about the fears that I had, what I thought was going to happen, and what we could do to fight against that. But nothing came out. It was like a blank screen. So then one day I said, well, you know something, let me try my art. Maybe I could express myself and all these feelings that I'm having through my artwork, is what I thought, you know. So sure enough, I developed my first piece, which I called We the People. And it's dedicated, it's a, it's a picture of the uh, United States, the American flag, and all the people that work and live in, 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 in uh, you know, of different races and different colors. And it wasn't just the people that Clinton and, and Trump were talking about. <laughs> so anyway, um, then I, 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 I did a couple more of these. They're collages, but they're paintings with a lot of color in them. And, and the colors express emotions, too. Mm. So I was using my emotions and expressing them not only through the words that are on the collages, but also through the colors that came out, you know, the bright oranges and red and the yellows and the American flag and all this other stuff. So um, then I started showing it to a few of my friends that I was working with, and they really liked them, you know. And I thought to myself, wow, I, you know, I was just doing this to express myself. So now it turns out that they said, well, you should exhibit them and show them around, you know. So by that time, I had maybe like four or five. Eventually, I, I, I did 10. So um, then uh, they said, well, you should have an exhibit. And I said to myself, well, I don't really want to have an exhibit of my own work, because I've never <laughs> done an exhibit. You know, it was kind of. So I, I challenged five other artists in New Mexico that I had studied with back in, in the early 70s. And so uh, eventually, I put together a show called We the People. El Pueblo Unido for Peace, Justice, and Mother Earth. And I challenged some of these artists. And uh, one of them said, well, you know, I don't like to be against something. And I said, well, be for something. What mm -hmm. are you for? You know, so then, and, and it's amazing how, you know, they uh, created like about 26 different pieces of five, six of us together. And we had an exhibit in Albuquerque. And then, uh, so that's how this show came about. Wow, and how many artworks are you showcasing here? Uh, right here, there's, I think, uh, 12 okay. or 13, because afterward, after the exhibit in New Mexico, uh, uh, I was told that it was, you know, that March, I know it's International Women's Month, so I, I wanted to do a few more that, were, that had, like, women's themes. So I did, I think, three more. So I think there's either 12 or 13. <laughs> I forget okay. now. Yeah. Well, let's chat about your technique because this is something that, I, like, I was chatting with you before. It's something that is underestimated, I think, from people who don't know um, the collage technique. Mm -hmm. And it is not as simple as, you know, just painting or doing a sculpture, mm -hmm. one single media. This is something that the artist na needs to know, technique, needs to be inspired, and needs to know how to express from gathering the materials, putting together, laying out a good composition. What was your process for this, for this work? Okay. Well, actually, I, I just want to say something real quick. When I studied art in, uh, in, in college, they taught us how to use oils. Okay. So that's how I, I learned to paint in oils and draw and stuff like that. But I had never done acrylics and I had never done watercolors. Yeah. So I started teaching myself just by looking at videos on, on TV and stuff like that. And so I liked acrylics because you could use like the, the, the paint straight out of the tube. Like there are some in here that are very bright. Some of them you mix, but some of them just come straight out and they're very bright and, and it dries really fast. So you have to be like quick, but on the other hand, I think that you know it's a different medium, very different from oils. So I wanted to do to try my hand at acrylics, and then um, you each one of these pieces takes like hours and hours mm. and hours and hours. Like I researched, I looked at thousands of images in magazines, photographs, uh, in the internet, and stuff like that. 
to become inspired. And, and some of them, like this one, has original paintings that are actually that I did little paintings there. But others are just photographs that I saw that really captured me and said, wow, this is, this is what I want to. So that's how it, it comes together, you know, a lot of planning. And then you have to think about the design, you know, like uh, should I put this figure over there or over here? And some of them I put like too much wording, so then I <laughs> scraped them off and I washed them <laughs> off and I added more color and maybe put a different you know, thing, you know, so. And then this one, um, this one really shows like the, the orange is to, to uh, kind of portray the hell that we've created on this earth. Mm. You know, we were given a beautiful planet by the creator, the universe. Somebody put us on this beautiful planet and we've gone about destroying it through, you know, all kinds of different ways. So this one has the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which I used to be religious in my younger <laughs> age. So it kind of shows here and it talks about famine and plague and death and war. So I, I use that as, you know, how apocalyptic kind of, you know, so, so then th this clock over here, a lot of people uh, have that clock, but they put it that very close to midnight. I wanted to be generous and say, we have two hours, folks. <laughs> and if wow. we don't get it together <laughs> in two hours, you know, then uh, uh, what, what this is what's going to happen. And we're, you know, we're destroying not, not only the, the animals, but the forest and, and, and ourselves, our earth. We're choking ourselves up so that, you know, those and you have all the logos and the corporations and yeah then i have all the corporations mm -hmm. uh, some of the major corporations that are responsible for a lot of this because yes each one of us has to take a responsibility but it's these major corporations that are really that's their job to get as much profit to rape the earth to do all kinds of things without caring or being responsible for what they do so that's you know kind of like and I have some other symbols in there, but that's, that's what it is. It's like symbols and words and colors, and that's what I try to do. Okay. The so this is a new, for you, I think, is this something new that you're, um, a message, you're trying to convey a message in a way that it's not screaming, it's, it's loud color. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> yes, yes. Everything I... It seems like, you, you know, like uh, we, we live in a technological world where yeah. everybody's over here scrolling and we're bombarded with messages and, and words and images and stuff like that. So this kind of does that, too. It bombards you with a lot. But, uh, you know, it, I, I had to do something to capture pictures of uh, people's attention. Like, you know, who wants to? This is hell. So I have these people freaking out and screaming and saying, oh, my God, look what we've done. So I, I try to make images that kind of provoke people also. Yes. Like over here talking about the genocide of the Indians, and I have some of the culprits over there, like Custer and Kit Carson. And, and you know, so I, I, I do, I, it's kind of like provocative to get people to think and react. Some people will say, well, that's horrible. And somebody, well, why is it horrible? Oh, you know, so I, I think it does. I I hope it does, <laughs> that it touches people in some Tell way. Tell us a little bit about your background so that we can explain more about this uh, painting behind me. Well, uh, I'm from northern New Mexico. Yeah. I was born and raised as a Chicana, Mexicana. You know, my, my grandparents never knew the word Chicano. That's something that we <laughs> developed for ourselves in the Chicano movement. It's a, like a political term that meant, you know, we were tired of being called greasers and dirty Mexicans oh. and wetbacks. So we wanted to be, we chose a word called Chicano, Chicano and Chicana, which kind of like was pride. The youth took pride in being of this particular ancestry, but not the regular Mexicano or Mexicana. So that, that was a term that we used for a movement that, you know, that uh, crossed across many states, you know. So, uh, but the other th interesting thing is that people in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado used to call themselves Spanish American. Before mm. Chicano came along, okay. we all were told that we were Spanish-American descendants from the conquistadores, and we were very proud. <laughs> and yet, look at my features, <laughs> and you look at other people from northern New Mexico, and everybody's dark with Indian features, but we were all Spaniards, Spanish-American. Yeah. And so um, my grandmother, w I knew that she was part Navajo. Mm -hmm. And she actually went to a government school, but she didn't want us wearing bangs because she thought we looked Indian. So we had to not look Indian because I everybody was made to feel that uh, if you weren't light skinned and white and Spanish or Anglo, you didn't have any value. So we learned kind of like to s self hate mm -hmm. and identify. So we wanted to identify with a conqueror, the victor, the, you know. 
So all of that took, you know, a lot of undoing, you know, and people are still undoing that. So that's, that was my upbringing. But we were also very proud, like Mexicanos, so we had a lot of Mexican music and Mexican cultura and stuff like that, even though none of us had ever been to Mexico, <laughs> yeah, you know. But anyway, so, <laughs> 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 but you know, Mexico, the, uh, New Mexico used to be part of Mexico at one time. So all of that stuff, like you don't learn that in, in, in school. Right. You right. have to go out and search that and, and you have to learn it. So once you learn all of that, you can't turn your back again, uh, and, and say, well, pretend that, that that's not the truth. Yeah. So, uh, at least I couldn't do that. So I just began to educate myself more and more and develop my thinking in this direction. <laughs> Great. And I think this administration has done a lot of things. <laughs> Negative, and but the effect, I can also see a, a positive effect. Although I would say that what's coming out there, I don't think it was something that was, that was not there. It was probably hidden. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't see it because I think anybody that has been a minority knows and has gone through situations that now are coming up because mm -hmm. of you know why. Mm -hmm. right, so right. I think the positive part here is seeing artists like you coming up and raising and, and you know I have I have met a few artists and it looks like we are in the midst of a transformation, a universal transformation mm -hmm. where the artist is rising, the activist is coming up stronger um, you know, everybody seems to be getting together. What would you say to the artists out there that are wanting to develop this, what you're doing? Well, I, I would definitely encourage them because I think just the way people compose songs and write poetry and write all this other stuff, you know, art can be a medium to wake people up, to inspire people, to get people to, uh, I think people, you know, yes, we can paint beautiful canyons yeah. and landscapes and all this stuff, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love to do birds and flowers and all this other stuff too, but I think that art can be used in, in this today, you know, as a medium that carries messages that people need to hear and yes. that get, get people to thinking and maybe inspire them to use whatever, whatever talent we have, I think we need to use for the betterment of humanity. Basically, that's the underlying message. True. And that's your message in life. Yes. And, and following that line, in the 90s, something happened in your life mm -hmm. that was kind of negative or impacted you and you use it for the better of humanity. Can you share that? Yeah, <laughs> um, in the 90s, uh, uh, my son, my only child, uh, came to my job one day and he's sitting there and he has like kind of like a long face and kind of like looking down and I said I said what's going on Miguel like I knew something was wrong you know and he says I don't know how to tell you this he said uh, I joined the Navy and I said what you know because knowing that I have all these beliefs you know and my son tells me he joins the Navy so I sat down and the tears just started rolling <laughs> down my face, you know, and I said, oh my God, Miguel, why? He says, because, he says, we're living in a dead end over here in Las Vegas, there's nothing for me. He says, I don't want to wind up in the streets and using drugs and stuff like that. So he says, so we joined, so four guys, Chicanitos, decided they got uh, had a few beers too many and they went <laughs> to the <laughs> <laughs> recruiting center <laughs> and they signed up for the Navy. And who would have thought? You know, it, oh, okay, they, you know, s join the Navy, travel, see the world. But within a few months, we were at war. And honestly, they took those kids, and within four months, they had them fighting. Because, there, they, you know, th there hadn't been any talk of war before that we yeah. knew. But anyway, so my son joined the military, and I came to New York City. I was living in New Mexico. I moved over here, and I began looking for people that I could connect with who were against the war. And I couldn't find, there was nothing going on in New York City. Nobody was protesting. And then I read a, uh, an editorial in the New York Times by a professor in Wisconsin. His name was Alex Molnar. And he wrote an editorial. It was a letter to President Bush. Dear President Bush, if my Marine sign son dies, then like I'm coming after you, basically is mm -hmm. what it said. And so I got in touch with him. And before you know it, 
uh, somebody who's here in the audience and I, we started a chapter here. It was called the Military Family Support Network. We started a chapter here in New York City and it became the largest and most active chapter in the whole country. And we had people like in 20 states. Then th we were all family members. This was the, uh, it wasn't like, like your usual peace activist, which some of us were, but it was our family members. So my son's over there fighting in a war and, and I'm over here organizing, you know. And what, were, what do you guys do? Oh, well, first of all, uh, people were hysterical. I myself lost like 20 pounds. I mean, just I, I just couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep because it was all over in all the media. It was just on the front page of the Times. And I, I used to read like five papers a day. And um, don't tell me what that I just, it just, it's a little traumatic even now. I can this imagine. Many years. Oh. But what were, what were the steps you oh, were Oh, oh, no. And, and so um, everybody was traumatized. I was uh, saying to somebody earlier that that's the first time that I have ever seen grown men crying for their children. I have always seen mothers concerned about children, their children. It's always been the mother who goes to the PTA meetings. And, but here were these fathers whose daughters and sons had been sent over there and, and we were all hysterical. So we, the first thing we did was we organized support groups and we had like therapists that would come and talk to us. The second thing we did was we tried to uh, organize other people who, you know, and then we recruited people who had family, you know, and we were, we had African Americans, we had Latinos and uh, Jewish, different, you know, uh, so, and we didn't have any politics in terms of, it doesn't matter if you're socialist or if you're not, you know, uh, if you're conservative, we're here to offer each support to each other and to try to stop this crazy war and to try to bring about a diplomatic solution. But then we also marched in the streets. We talked in synagogues and churches at St. John the Divine, in schools all over. And, th and then we had all of it. We mobilized a gigantic march in Washington, D.C. But it was all about speak outs and marches and protests and you know, stuff like that. Incredible. That's what we did, yeah. <laughs> you had an incredible journey. <laughs> you have to write a book, I've told you, right? <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And now you're putting this in, in this. Yes, yes. Uh, paintings. There, there's a couple of paintings out in the gallery that, that, that deal with uh, anti war, mm -hmm. the, the craziness with the, the, the obsession that this country has with militarism and spending all our money sending it over to fight useless wars, destroying our youth, and, and not, uh, you know misusing and, and it giving money to uh, military contractors instead of putting it into our infrastructure or into our schools or into, you know, bettering our lives. Yeah, so and you are based in New Mexico now? Uh, yes, I live in New Mexico. Have I you thought now. about coming back to New York? I have. Yes. I have actually okay. thought of coming back to New York and maybe getting the old military uh, families, veterans together and seeing if we stop, you know, if there's a war in North Korea or against Iran or whatever, because this country is always like trying to create a war somewhere, I yes. think. Yes, yes. What's next for you? Well, uh, in 2014, I retired after mm. working for 15 years in a domestic violence, ag against domestic violence. And I, I, I didn't last more than six months before I became bored. <laughs> 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 and so I, I've been, you know, so uh, I don't know. I guess I, I still haven't found my calling at my age. <laughs> you know. So I don't know. I want to continue my art, definitely. I want to continue my art, and I hope to inspire other uh, young artists, old artists, whoever, to use art as a medium. But I also am uh, seriously considering writing my story. And Definitely. focused with the different movements that I've been involved in. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So those are the things that I... What would be your message for the youth right now? We're living very difficult times, um, not only as, a, as an artist, as a mother, mm -hmm. as a grandmother, as mm -hmm. a soul, as a sister. Yeah, uh, basically is to uh, find out what talents and skills you, you have mm. and don't waste them. Don't let them, don't, don't get a job in a factory doing something when, you know, y your passion is somewhere else. You know, uh, I'm, I won't even say how old I am, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not young <laughs> anymore. And now I'm doing something that I, that I wanted to do all my life and never had the time or whatever dedication to do. And so I think I, I would like to, s and use them for a good purpose. Not right. necessarily just to make money, but to, you know, to, to uh, make changes in the world for the, for the better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll, we're like we're on time to make those changes? 
Do we have hope? It's uh, 10 o'clock. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so so I, I don't, we don't, you know, we may not have a lot of time. I think that uh, all of us have to work together. Everybody, I don't care if you're a doctor or a nurse or mm. a lawyer or, or an artist or a magazine writer, whatever, editor. It doesn't matter what we are. We can each do something positive instead of doing something negative, you know. So I think that if we wake up and say, what have we done? Let's stop it. Let's do something beautiful with our lives and with, w with our planet. Yes, yes. So how long are you going to stay in New York? And when, if anybody wants to come and visit your exhibition, where can they meet you? Here? Well, I'm just going to be here for a few days. Oh, yeah. okay. So okay. I just actually uh, was flown here uh, just for the exhibit and to, you know, so I, I'm tr that's why I was hoping that friends and, and co-workers that I had known here for many years would show up so that I could see them and, you know. Yeah. So uh, the exhibit's going to be here for a couple of months. Until but June. I'm not. Yep. Okay. You know, but I'm available if people want to talk to me by phone or, you know. The head of the media center, Senaida Mendez, knows how to get a hold of me. All right. And you're in New Mexico creating? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Any yeah. new series coming up? Uh, well, sometimes, I, like I said, I you know I was I was dabbling with watercolors too, okay. and that's another. So sometimes I just like to do, uh, like I love to do things that have feathers. So I like to do oh. beauty too, you know, like birds from different colored birds and stuff like that. But uh, but I I want to continue along this line too and try to get other uh, artists in New Mexico mm -hmm. and maybe uh, take that exhibit with the people at Pueblo Unido to other states like maybe San Antonio maybe California you know and maybe even New York I was talking to a guy here earlier and he works with one of the talleres here and he said that uh, maybe we could do like a Chicano Puerto Rican. Colombian. Collaboration <laughs> with Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And just so, yeah, who knows, you know? You, you, you know. Unity. Yeah, Unity. Yeah, yeah. And inspire other people to do that. I think people respond, have responded very well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think artists are bringing awareness. Mm -hmm. Artists are really looking to that unity right now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, who knows? I'm open to whatever the future brings. Okay. As long as it's positive. Wonderful. Well, I thank you so much for your incredible time. And like mm -hmm. I told you, we would need hours. <laughs> 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 you have such an incredible journey. <laughs> and, and the more I discover about you, the more I admire you, <laughs> really. I, I'm pretty sure it's like that with most people that know you. Thank you. So I hope we can read your memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I hope I can write them, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I want to. Yes, mm. yes. All righty. Well, thank you so much. And thank thanks, everyone, for watching. I hope you guys come by uh, El Barrio Firehouse and enjoy <laughs> this exhibition, which is incredible. The works are amazing. I love the color, the color work. The, the message is really compelling, so it's really worth to come, stop by, call Senaira, uh, get in touch with everyone here, and stay inspired.